Uh, hello, everyone. Um, my name is Alex Fleetwood, and I'm the founder of Hide and Seek, a game design studio uh, based here in London. Um, to set the tone for this talk, I'm going to begin uh, by reading out three quotes, one from a Catholic saint, one from a conservative philosopher, and one from a 21st century uh, game maker and critic. St. Ignatius, founder of the Jesuits, said, great principles must be embodied in the circumstances of place, time, and people. Roger Scruton said, the ethical life is maintained in a common culture, which also upholds the togetherness of society. And Carl Ellison, this week, recently, said, the little lights of video game culture that we have are stitched together with love and the hope that one day we will have space and investment for them. London, your soul is tarnished. Are you a place for life or for the preservation of a cultureless class whose credit cards invest in paintings produced in an era they will never let happen again? Where are the monoliths built to our artists? Today I'm going to talk about the need for institutions to support our common game culture. Because I think Cara is right. We do need monoliths for our artists. Game culture is over 50 years old. I'm going to start in the future, imagining what a game space might look like, what it might contain, and what people might do there. I'm then going to go back to the past to look at conditions that supported the, the emergence of other public interventions into our common culture, such as the British Film Institute and Channel 4. And finally, I want to talk about our present. I want to talk about the state we're in. As someone who's been attempting to make games in cultural institutions in London and around the world over the last seven years, I want to share some of my experience about what that's been like and what I think might need to change. If you were expecting ludic jollity, I apologize. There are no secret cards taped to the underside of your cushion. There will be no moments of epiphany where we can all laugh and clap. There will be no pictures, probably no gags. Just dry, practice-led policy analysis set in the difficult context of the austere, conservative cultural landscape of 2013. In the future, game culture will move alongside the other types of culture that lay claim to our public space in our towns and cities. As well as cinemas, opera houses, art galleries, and theaters, there will be game spaces, places where the continuously evolving practice of games and play can be experienced as part of our civic life. There will be big ones in places like London and Manchester and Glasgow, and smaller ones anywhere where there is enough people to sustain them. Game spaces by the beach, game spaces in villages, game spaces nestled on the edge of national parks. Going out to play will be as common an activity as going out to eat or going to shop. These game spaces will be inevitably sites of action in both the real world and on digital platforms and devices. And consequently, the infrastructure of these buildings will be conceived by architects and engineers to enable play. That means, more than anything, plasticity, the ability to admit different kinds of play of players. Games, more than any form of culture, team with systemic and technological diversity, making use of every different kind of technology that humans have ever invented. As Eric Zimmerman put it, media and culture in the ludic century is increasingly systemic, modular, customizable, and participatory. Game spaces will be conceived and built to support this multifaceted culture, enabling each individual player to set their own relationship with the space that they are in. In these spaces, there will be people. People playing, people not playing, people watching other people play, people doing whatever it is that they want to do. In doing this, they will gently lay to rest the ghost of the word gamer. Game playing will be a cultural literacy that will simply be taken for granted. They will be comfortable with the complexity of the games that they encounter, playing the ones that suit them. The playing public will be supported in this by dedicated, salaried professionals who care about how games are presented, who reach out to people with passion and enthusiasm, who solve problems of display and interaction in ingenious ways. These people will decide what games you should play. They will make recommendations based on their insight and their experience, and they will argue vehemently, using the force of the space that they inhabit, for you to see their view. We will invent new job titles for these people as words like curation begin to lose their meaning. These game spaces will be in turn supported by national and maybe even supranational organizations who will care for games in other ways. They'll take responsibility for archiving games and preserving hardware. 
They'll focus on education and ensuring equality of access to the tools of game making. They'll create platforms and business models that coexist with those owned and maintained by corporations and invest in games with a view to creating different kinds of value. In this landscape, it will be possible for game makers from diverse backgrounds to receive training, support, and encouragement at every stage of their career. They will be encouraged to develop an individual voice in the context of a public service framework that supports the provision of a broad range of high-quality games that demonstrate innovation, experiment, and creativity in both the form and content, and appeal to the tastes and interests of a diverse society. Game makers will still work with commercial publishers, with brands, with investors, and of course, they will still make games independently, charging and distributing them as they see fit. The national game space will merely offer an alternative, one where different kinds of support are offered. Finally, it's important to talk about resources. All of the things that I have described will cost money. It will be expensive to do these things. But the money will have been found, and the British government will have secured the ongoing existence of the national game space indefinitely in the public interest. The national game space can and should operate commercially. It will derive revenues from multiple sources and make use of concessions from the government that enable it to plan for the long term. Again, all of this resource is ultimately put to use in the service of cultural creation and access. The good news is that we don't have to look far into our history to discover models for this future. This is part of the broadcasting license for Channel 4. Brought into existence by a government act in 1982 and prohibited from making its own programs, the channel was a powerful platform for independent voices and ideas, a commissioning fund available to artists, performers, uh, journalists, and producers whose work demonstrated adherence to the channel's founding principles of innovation, diversity, education, and distinctiveness. Going back further to 1947, and I recommend that you read these in your head using your best post-war Radio 4 announcer's voice, these set of recommendations for the British Film Institute sparked the rapid growth and development of that organization under director David Foreman, including the creation of the Telecinema, later the National Film Theatre, on the South Bank as part of the Festival of Britain. If you try to extrapolate forward from those policy interventions, the imagination of policymakers as inscribed in those words to the present day, I think you can witness their effects in the rise of extraordinary filmmakers like Clio Barnard and Steve McQueen. These are both individuals who had successful careers as fine artists, who were both supported by Channel 4 in the creation of their first full-length films, and who are both now enjoying international recognition for their latest features, wowing festival audiences around the world, and tipped for commercial and Oscar success. It's not just at the independent level that you can see the success of this. You can also see it in the fusion between policy, culture, and commerce and creativity in the world's biggest film franchises. The National Theatre of Bond is powered by UK the theatrical talent, which in turn rose up through an ecosystem of funded and supported theatres around the UK. So that's the future and that's the past. And in order to locate us in the problems of the present, I'm going to ask you to engage in a little thought experiment. Over the last 10 or 15 years, um, cultural policy in this country has asked existing cultural institutions to adopt and engage with new forms of culture as part of their mission. What would it be like if we had cultural institutions who had successfully adapted the core of their mission to include games already? What might they be called? We might have the British Broadcasting and Games Corporation. We might have the Royal Opera and also Games House. Or, my personal favorite, the sponsors of this fantastic event, Nestag. <laughs> I make this slightly hackneyed joke in the hope of demonstrating that the function of our cultural organizations and the policy making access to public funds and resources and civic space that surrounds them have an enormous effect on our culture. My experience, and as the director of Hide and Seek, I've worked with all of the organizations I've just listed and many more, is that it is close to impossible for an organization whose purpose is organized around the production and promotion of a particular kind of culture to fully and expertly turn their attention to a different kind. Organizations, no matter what the intentions of the brilliant, wonderful people who work in them, have a prevailing direction. 
And no wonder. Making things is hard. It's completely understandable that if you have to put shows on every night or get TV onto the, on the, onto the screen every day, that processes and attitudes spring up in an organization that ingrain that into the way that that organization works, that support and enable making of a particular kind. So I'm left baffled as to why policymakers and funders um, continue to ask this of our cultural organizations. Why do we ignore the lessons of history which show us that it's clearly possible to imagine and create and support entirely new cultural institutions where those processes and where that grain and that prevailing direction can support that new kind of culture and instead ask the ones we've already got to take care of everything that's new as well. We operate in a landscape dominated by a policy that requires existing cultural organizations to change. They are required to become digital, to adapt their business model, to embrace new technologies, to seek out new participating audiences, to innovate. The policymakers in turn set targets to measure that success. Consequently, they engage studios like us, because games proved useful in this context for achieving those targets. Games get the kids interested. Games can make money. Games can create participation and engagement. What that means is that we are hardly ever asked to make a game for its own sake. We're very rarely part of a conversation where the value of the game itself is something under consideration. We are inevitably hedging our own creativity and ideas in the service of another culture's values. And I think that suffocates the possibility of a more perfect union between our common game culture of 2013 and the civic culture at play in our cities. Game culture is instead left to the mercies of the digital marketplace, to the app store, to global publishers, and to the determination of independent studios who find a way to make work that they value and that also sustains them. I think game culture deserves better than that. I think it deserves support, challenge, access, and presence. I have been searching for an appropriate metaphor to describe game culture's current relationship to the civic culture of the UK. And the best I can find is to imagine a B-movie scientist attempting to graft a new and healthy limb onto an aging body in the hope that it will serve some new and useful function. And in that analogy, I'm afraid that we, the pioneers of game culture, are the foreign body, an alien to the host, a bundle of unruly growth, admitted in error and rejected in panic. I would contrast that sad reality with the vision of policymakers in 1982 and 1947, both years of real austerity and crisis in this country. Yet there was still sufficient energy in the political body to observe the values at play in the cultures of television and film and attempt to harness them for the public good. There was an imagination that enabled them to see the need for vigorous, independent, ongoing support. And I think it's evident that that imagination resulted in incalculable good for our country. So I believe we need to reframe this entire debate. We need to stop thinking about games in terms of what they can do, and we need to start supporting games for what they are. That means, first, to reflect on the reality of game culture in 2013 in all its thriving, complex, and fascinating diversity. We need to listen to game makers and artists, and we need to believe that it's possible to build a permanent, visionary, well-supported game culture in this country. I could, at this stage, point to green shoots of development around the country and the world. The triumphant partnership between Nottingham and Game City, the successful funding of the LA game space, and the pioneering work of Gaete Lyrique in Paris. But my purpose here is not to leave you with a happy ending. The future I hope for will not happen unless we will it to. It needs collaboration, humility, imagination, and most of all, persistence. Thank you.